Hi everyone, thanks for coming to my talk. Uh, my name is Josh Romero, I'm a developer technology engineer at NVIDIA, and today I'll be presenting some work I did in collaboration with colleagues at Oak Ridge National Laboratory and Uber titled Accelerating Collective Communication and Data Parallel Training Across Deep Learning Frameworks. So let's begin with a little bit of motivation first. Um, over the past few years, the usage of deep learning within an HPC or scientific computing context has exploded in popularity. Uh, basically, science codes generate a ton of simulation data, and deep learning has unlocked advanced data analytics that weren't uh, formerly possible. And these scientists uh, at the DOE, like my colleagues, uh, would like to leverage uh, deep learning more in their existing workflows. Um, on top of this, HPC centers are historically home to the largest supercomputing clusters, uh, purpose-built for performance scaling of these science programs from a handful of CPUs or GPUs to thousands of CPUs and GPUs. Uh, for example, uh, the Summit supercomputer, which we'll be talking about in the study, has 27,000 V100 GPUs available. Um, so in order to take advantage of these, ex these extreme scale resources for DL, we desire to have a, a deep learning framework communication library that can scale uh, as well as any well-tuned science code on these types of systems. For this work, we decided to leverage Horovod, an existing framework for distributed uh, deep learning that's pretty popular in the field. Uh, Horvod was originally developed by Uber to convert single worker TensorFlow scripts uh, into multi worker data parallel scripts for their internal use, uh, but is now a much broader project within the Linux Foundation AI. Uh, Horvod is simple, just requires a few lines of modifications to existing scripts to make them data parallel, and it's also framework agnostic, meaning that it supports multiple frameworks like uh, TensorFlow, PyTorch, and MXNet. Before moving on to the meat of this talk, we should first describe what key challenge Horvod tries to solve. Basically, these deep learning frameworks will typically use graph-based operation scheduling, meaning that uh, individual workers of these frameworks will not necessarily submit operations in deterministic orders. Uh, for a framework like Horovod, which is trying to facilitate global communication between these workers, this out-of-order execution can cause problems, especially if these workers are submitting collective operations out of order. Uh, in order to avoid deadlocking, a mechanism to coordinate uh, and schedule these collective operations so that uh, they happen in a globally consistent order needs to be established. So how does Horovod co uh, coordinate these collectives? Well, the core design of Horovod relies on something that we call the control plane, uh, which processes incoming requests uh, that I'll refer to as metadata from all workers and determines what per, uh, collectives perform and at what time. So this control plane uses a coordinator worker design where a single worker is tasked with pretty much all of the decision-making logic. Um, these control messages are generated and transferred to, uh, the, from the coordinator into the workers uh, across the network using MPI or the Glue communication library. Um, a key point to understand also is that this uh, control plane operates dynamically. Uh, what I mean by that is that this coordination logic runs in a background thread on each worker uh, that checks for new tensors in a fixed tick rate, uh, which we refer to as a Horovod cycle. So, for example, every one millisecond or so, this background thread will wake up, uh, check for new messages, and then go to sleep uh, throughout the course of training. Uh, once the coordination plane determines that there is some collective work that uh, is common across the workers and can be, uh, can be executed, uh, the actual collective operations, all reduce, all gather, broadcast, um, are carried out in something that we call the data plane using uh, either MPI, Nickel, or Glue. So that was kind of a high-level description. I think it is useful to have a more visual uh, diagram of how the uh, Horvath coordination process works, um, especially because this is important to uh, motivate the uh, improvements that we will share later on in this talk. Uh, so in this slide here, I have this diagram showing four workers, uh, rank zero through rank three, uh, by these green squares. Uh, the upper blue rectangle is where I will show kind of control coordination plane operations, and then the green rectangle below is uh, where we'll show the data plane operations. Um, so rank zero, which I've labeled the coordinator, also has this message table, this blue square on the side, uh, that will be useful um, in the process. So at a particular Horovod cycle, uh, some workers will have some tensors that need to be uh, all reduced. Um, so in this case, we have rank 0 has these tensors A, C, rank 1 has a tensor B, rank 3 has tensor A. These are tensors that the framework has determined need to be uh, summed up across all the workers at a particular time. So first what happens is uh, each worker except for rank 0 creates these uh, message objects, which are metadata uh, describing the tensors that it wants uh, to be reduced. 
So in this case, rank one will create a message for tensor B, rank three will create a message for uh, tensor A, uh, rank two has nothing, so no message, and these messages are gathered to rank zero, the coordinator. Rank zero then uh, processes these messages, uh, including messages corresponding to its own tensors, and places them into this message table. Um, it checks to see if any of the tensors in the message table have a full set of messages, meaning that there's uh, you know, a number of messages equal to the number of workers, in this case four, uh, to determine whether or not a collective is ready to be executed. In this case, there are no tensors with a full set of messages, uh, so we move on to the next cycle. On the next cycle, uh, more tensors will come in from the framework that are ready to be all reduced. So again, we repeat the process where all the workers will generate these messages that get gathered to rank zero for new tensors that come in. And then rank zero will uh, record these messages into the message table. On this cycle, however, we see that tensor A has uh, four messages that rank zero has received, which is an indication to the coordinator that this tensor is ready uh, for a collective. Uh, so rank zero will create a response message uh, and broadcast that to all of the workers. And then the workers will uh, proceed to do the all reduce on A uh, in the data plane, then signal to the framework that uh, the tensor A data is ready for consumption. So now having described the Horovod coordination process, we can start to look into what scalability issues exist within that design. Um, so for some of you in the room here, uh, it might be obvious, but relying on a single coordinator rank can be a major bottleneck, especially at large scale. Um, maybe for you know tens of workers, it's okay, but when you're trying to scale up to a workload with thousands or 27,000 workers, uh, inefficiencies in this uh, control plane uh, metadata message passing uh, can easily add up and, and ruin your scaling performance. Um, these limitations are actually first discussed in a paper titled Exascale Deep Learning for Climate Analytics by Kurth and others at Supercomputing 18. So in that paper, they did scale a uh, DL training workload on the full Summit supercomputer and achieved a peak compute of one exaop in FB16. Um, in that paper, they indeed reported a control plane scaling issues in Horvod, and they implemented their own fix, uh, but it was never upstream due to a lack of generality in their approach. Um, additionally, the scaling performance that they achieved required a one iteration lag, meaning that they allow the gradients to go stale uh, for one step, which is not uh, quite common in deep learning practice. Um, in other words, the training wasn't fully synchronous. So this is where we were when we first started uh, this project using uh, publicly available Horovod. Um, on the right, we show a scaling plot of the performance of our model in petaflops uh, versus number of GPUs. Um, using the different available Horovod uh, data plane backends that were available at the time. And basically the takeaway from this plot is that at the beginning of the study, none of the available uh, options in Horovod were shown to scale well, indicating that control plane issues were still unresolved in Horovod. Uh, to clarify, the ideal line here is assuming that uh, we can take the single GPU performance and just multiply it by the number of GPUs uh, and achieve that level of performance. So that brings us to our goals. Uh, first of all, we want to improve the scaling performance of Horovod, uh, but also make sure that we could contribute those changes back to the upstream library. And then we also want to scale training of the STEMDL model, which I'll cover in the next slide, to the full Summit supercomputer and achieve high performance with truly synchronous training. Here's a slide uh, briefly describing the STEMDL model, though for more details you can check out the paper. Uh, basically, the STEMDL model attempts to solve an inverse problem in electron microscopy, uh, generating local electron densities from diffraction data generated from uh, this electron microscope. Um, the model itself is implemented using an encoder-decoder model based on FC DenseNet. Um, and as far as model size goes, it's uh, about 220 million trainable parameters, which is a fairly large model. With that, let's move on to discussing the improvements we uh, share in the paper. So the first improvement we have is something that we call response caching. So our main observation is that the set of tensors requiring communication is typically fixed during a deep learning training. Uh, basically, uh, deep learning training will run uh, the same iteration, training iterations over and over again on the same tensors, uh, meaning that the communication that is required uh, is generally repeated, right? Uh, one thing you'll, you'll notice about the existing Horovod uh, coordination design is that it doesn't take advantage of this and will redundantly communicate and process this control metadata via the coordinator every training iteration. Um, so what we designed was a caching solution to bypass this redundant control communication. Um, 
You can see a lot more details in the paper, but basically what we do is we'll run the Horvath control plane uh, for one single iteration, and we will cache the response information that the uh, coordinator generates uh, in local caches on each worker. Uh, a key point about this cache is that we keep it globally consistent, which allows us to use it uh, as a, a global enumeration of observed tensors, which enables a lightweight uh, coordination communication using a bit vector. Um, I'll cover this in the next slide, so don't worry. Um, what, what's cool about this approach, though, is that writing these decisions are now made collectively rather than relying on a single coordinator rank. So we'll go back to this uh, coordination process diagram that I had before, but this time we'll show how it works with caching. Uh, so again, we have the same setup with four ranks, uh, the control plane on top, the data plane below. So in this case, we assume that we ran one, uh, one iteration of our training, and each worker has this response cache locally that stores the response object that it, achieve, uh, that it obtained from rank zero uh, during the first iteration of the training. So this response cache uh, is keyed by the name of the tensor, so in this case, A, B, and C, and the value is a position in a bit vector, so in this case, zero, one, or two, and the actual response object it, needed, it needs in order to uh, do the, the collective that happened before. So this is what would happen in a cycle. Some tensors show up on the workers like before, but this time, instead of actually uh, you know, creating these metadata structures and, and shipping them off to rank zero with a gather, they each will locally populate this bit vector. In this case, it's a bit vector of three bits, uh, setting bits corresponding to the tensors that uh, each worker has in its own queue. So rank zero has all the tensors, so all the bits are set. Rank one only has two, so position zero and uh, two are set, etc. Then in order to, uh, to coordinate this information, they'll just do an all reduce via MPI or glue, uh, with a bitwise AND, which is just a global set intersection. After this bitwise op uh, AND operation occurs, the, the set bits in the tensor correspond to, or the set bits in the bit vector correspond to the tensors that are common, uh, commonly ready across all workers. In this case, just the first position, which corresponds to tensor A. The workers can then use this information uh, to know to forward the A tensor to the data plane for collective uh, communication. Now, even just considering that description, it looks a lot simpler, but let's look at the actual data. So here on the plot uh, on the right, we are showing some results for a simple ResNet 50 model scaling from zero to about 800 GPUs on Summit uh, using this caching improvement uh, on and off with both TensorFlow and PyTorch, and also a comparison with another uh, communication library called BytePS. Uh, basically, the takeaway from this slide is that without caching, um, the existing Horovod implementation falls off from ideal scaling around 400 GPUs and doesn't recover, whereas when we enable this uh, caching optimization, uh, both the TensorFlow and PyTorch workloads using Horovod are able to achieve nearly ideal scaling. Um, the second improvement that we covered in the paper and added to Horovod is something called all-reduce grouping. Um, so I didn't cover this in too much detail early in this talk, though I refer uh, would refer you to the paper to look into it, but basically Horovod has an advanced functionality called Tensor Fusion, where it is able to uh, fuse uh, multiple ready tensors uh, into a single collective call. So for example, if two tensors are ready for all reduce at the same time, uh, Horovod can choose to uh, pack those tensors into a larger buffer and call one all reduce operation instead of multiple uh, for greater network efficiency. Now one problem is, uh, the sensor fusion is controlled dynamically via this cycle time, um, where all tensors ready during a given cycle are fused greedily. Now, this uh, introduces an interesting optimization problem. Um, so for minimum latency, we want to run the cycle time as low as possible in order to run this coordination logic more often, right? Um, but the problem is, as a side effect, if you run this cycle as fast as possible, you may get many unfused or small buffers uh, for collectives, which uh, more or less bypasses any benefits from uh, Horovod's tensor fusion. So our solution was to implement a grouping feature in Horovod, which allows users to explicitly control this tensor fusion. Basically, users can mark some tensors as being as part of a group, um, and that group must be fused no matter what, uh, regardless of what cycle the tensors show up at. Uh, what this enables is running Horovod at a very low cycle time for minimum latency, while ensuring that the buffer sizes uh, remain large for more efficient network utilization. 
Um, and then here's a plot on the right showing uh, the STEMDL workload with caching and grouping uh, enabled compared to where we were at the beginning. So this is basically the same plot as the first slide where we started, uh, showing uh, bad for about performance. But then this is showing uh, how the performance improves with both caching and grouping. And we see that caching and grouping uh, achieve much closer to ideal scaling on the STEMDL model up to 6,000 GPUs. And last but not least, we can share the results of our improvements uh, running our STEMDL workload on the entire Summit supercomputer. So again, 27,000 GPUs. Um, this plot on the right is showing our performance in petaflops uh, versus GPUs up to this 27,000 GPU number, where the red line here is showing ideal performance and the black dotted line is showing uh, the sustained uh, flop rate. Uh, what we see is that we were able to achieve a 1.54 exaop sustained and a 2.15 exaops peak training performance uh, in FP16, which outperforms the previous work by Kurth and others uh, at SC18. Uh, the other main point is that we were able to achieve the scaling using fully synchronous training with all the improvements upstream to uh, Horvat and available to the public. So with that, I'd like to end the talk, uh, but quick, just some acknowledgments. First to all of my co-authors. Uh, second to uh, our shepherd, uh, Shivaram, and also just to our funding agencies that made this effort possible.